Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. We take you now to the lineup. <laughs> to nurse you through this, will I, Mr. Magnoni? You know what to do, how to behave. Are you kidding, Lieutenant? I bet I'm your most steady customer at these shows. You know, it's getting so as I look forward to them. You enjoy the lineup, eh, Mr. Magnoni? Well, let's put it this way. If something disturbing don't happen in Magnoni's gin mill, I sulk. If someone don't get their teeth pushed in, I feel like I've been passed by by the world. Yeah, they tell me you had a good one last night. Oh, one of the best. This character got loaded in a way I never saw before, and I've seen many ways. He beat the other man up with his fists. He didn't use Only a Only with his fists. Also in a way I've never seen before. You know, it's a wonder the man didn't die right there. They tell me he's dying in a hospital, though. Maybe murder, huh? You think murder? May I have your attention, please? Hey, there's the sergeant. I like him. He grows on you. On the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among you. Please be prompt with your questions or identification. When the prisoners leave here, they're sent the to the bathroom. When the prisoners leave here, they are sent to the bathroom. I know it as good as he does. Better. Clothes. It makes it quite difficult to bring them back after they leave here. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Bring on the line. All right, boys, come on. Move right up to the end of the stage. You keep moving. Get a move on. Come on. Now turn and face the front. Hands to your sides. Look straight ahead. You, the third boy, lift your face so the light hits it. That's it. Number one, Myron Graham, possession. Where do you live, Myron? 1312 Troost Avenue. What's your business, Myron? I'm a salesman. What do you sell, Myron? What the kids ask what me for. What do you for. sell? What the kids ask me for, that's all. Shoelaces, potato peelers, things kids need. High school kids? I don't ask them do they got an education. Number two, Harry Weston, assault. How do you make a living, Harry? I'm a musician. I blow a clarinet. Where? The Troy Club on 15th. Why did you hit the girl? She wanted to walk me home. That was a reason to hit her? Sure, two of them were walking me home already. Three girls is a crowd. With me, anyway. Number three, Kip Stanley, theft. Where do you live, Kip? Out of town. Where out of town? Lakeshore Village, 1016 Shore Drive. It's expensive out that way. How do you do it, Kip? I keep my nose to the grindstone. My shoes shine, my pants pressed. I am pleasant and courteous. How do you live in such an expensive place, Kip? Friends lend me money. What friends, Kip? Friends I meet on the street. I tip my hat, bow slightly, show them my revolver. They become friendly, lend me money. Number four, George Miller Assault. Where do you live, George? Look, I, I don't feel so good. Where do you live, George? Matson Hotel on Elm, I think. I got that old the feeling. The man you beat up, George, one? did you know him? Let him huh? sweat a little more, the then I'll The man you say. beat up, George, did you know him? Look, I keep telling you, I'm not feeling good. The hangover will go away, George. Tell me about the man you hit. I don't remember. Look, Magnoni, if that's the man, tell us. Tell us right now. Are there any questions or identifications from the audience? Any questions or identifications, please? Magnoni. Yeah. Yeah, that's him. Number four. Sergeant, I'll take hold. care of it. Sergeant Graham. Yes, Lieutenant. Number four, hold for interrogation. Sit down, George. Tell me to lie down. That's what you ought to tell me to right do. Right there, that chair. Sit. Yeah. <laughs> Lieutenant, get some for me, huh? I'll tell you about an oversight, George. The department doesn't provide for hangovers. <laughs> Look, listen to me. Something's happening to me. Get me a doc, huh? Yeah. Yeah, whatever it is, it doesn't look good on you. Yes, sir? Get Dr. Lynn up here. Yes, sir. Now you're making me happy, Lieutenant. Fine. Now we'll talk. The man said I beat up a man. 
Happens every day. People beat up people. People get angry. The man you beat up is almost dead. If he dies, your assault charge will read manslaughter, maybe even murder. You know that, don't you? Don't you? You want to see me, Lieutenant? Uh, not me, Doctor. George. He's had a busy night. Doesn't feel good about it. George had a busy night, did he? Well, let's see now. I'd say George really did. Hangover? I've never heard it called that, Lieutenant. George is dead. <laughs> Come bearing gifts, Ben. Oh? Yeah, the coroner's report, a few sundry and assorted items, very interesting, and this nice cold drink, and a pair of straws. Ah, you owe thanks, me a dime. Mm-hmm. Ah, that's what I said, you owe me a dime. He was poisoned, eh? George Miller was poisoned. <sighs> okay, you'll buy me a cold drink the next time, huh? Yeah, he was poisoned. Yeah, he could have been suicide. Dr. Lynn doesn't think so, I don't think so, and I know you don't think so, so why tease ourselves? Maybe we're sick, Ben. I never felt better. Why do you say that? A man dies, our minds say he died because he was murdered. Occupational disease. Nine out of ten times we're right. In the case of George Miller, I know we're right. I don't know yet. That's because you don't know things I know. Oh. First of all, Dr. Lynn's autopsy report on George Miller says Miller was loaded with a type of poison no one in his right mind would choose to kill himself with. What time? All I know is on George Miller, it took almost 24 hours. In the home stretch, it hurt him good, real good. Like a hurt few people know, Dr. Lynn says. Mm -hmm. When you said you had something else, what else? There was a bullet wound in Miller's body. Oh? Maybe two months old. Tended to by a professional hand, Dr. Lynn said. Right here. Return the bottle so you can get your deposit back. Thanks. Not at all. Uh, what else? Well, the technical geniuses say Miller's hair, his mustache, and... Remember his hair and mustache? I remember. A dye job. The color of Miller's hair is brown. It was peroxide that made it what, what it was today. That's all, eh? No. No, that's not all, Ben. I had a photographer fix me up a picture of Miller, how he would look with his natural hair and without a mustache. Mm. Now, here, take a look. Mm. There, that reminds you of somebody? Yeah. But maybe I better check it on the wanted born. Yeah, go ahead and do that, Ben. I already did, but you go ahead and do that. Uh huh. George Bailey, wanted for bank robbery. Says here under a picture. Mm hmm. George Bailey, George Miller, same man. Rob Springfield Bank, June 1950, with accomplice Joe Raddick, both at large, dangerous. <laughs> well, let's get Miller's picture in all the papers, the old dope about the robbery. I don't know. Maybe the publicity will give us a murderer. Maybe Raddick. Maybe somebody else. You'll know what else to do without my telling you, huh? Sure. I'll get the deposit back on my bottle. Oh, here. Hmm? Don't forget your dime. Yes? A man outside to see you, Lieutenant. Who? He just said he's a representative of the Bluebell Cab Company. And what does he want? He just said it's a matter of urgency. Well, send him he in. I'm a representative of the Bluebell Cab Company. Now, what do you want? This whole thing is mysterious to me. Yesterday in the rain, I let a fare off in front of the Exeter Hotel. Ed, his fare gets out of the door. Two new fares get in. A man and a woman. Uh, yesterday, about... 2 p.m. in the afternoon. What do you want to see me about? Well, after I let the fare off the man that is, uh, the woman I dumped earlier. Well, anyhow, I get back to the garage, and I see this poster of a man that you police hang up in a garage, be on the lookout for this man, it said. So I said to myself, funny. Not knowing why at the time. Now I know. Look, I'm a busy yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, I'm not too busy for this. Fifteen minutes ago, I opened the newspaper, and I see the picture again. A man who dropped dead from poison in your office. It's the same as the fare I had yesterday. Only in blonde hair and a mustache to match. Where'd you leave him off? In the middle of downtown, a busy corner. And in anticipation of your question, I left the woman off at another place. You want to know where? Yes, yes, I do. Ruxton Avenue, 1647. Uh, did I interrupt you, Lieutenant? The doctor's office hours are from four to six. I'm sorry. Uh, my name's Guthrie, police officer. Oh, I see. Please come in. Did you want to talk with Dr. Carson? 
Well, I'm not sure. Uh, who are you? Mrs. Crossan, what is it you want? Do you know a man named George Bailey, Mrs. Crossan? Is he one of my husband's patients? Maybe you'd better talk George to him. George Miller. Why, well, I'm afraid I don't know what you're talking about. They're the same man. Uh, Mr. Guthrie, you might as well know I'm frightened. I'm not used to policemen coming in here and asking about men who have two names about do I know him. Jean? Jean? You'd uh, better talk to my husband, Mr. Guthrie. I'm trying to find out about a woman who took a cab ride yesterday about two. You call me, Craig? Uh, oh. Yes, what is it? Dr. Crossan? Yes, what is it? I'm a police officer, Dr. Ben Guthrie. I have my regular office hours, Mr. Guthrie, but... Uh... An officer? I was asking your wife whether she used a cab yesterday about 2 o'clock. Jean, I don't know why this man is it's here. It's just routine, Mrs. Cross, and don't get upset. My wife is upset. What do you want? About the cab. All I'm trying to do is find out if your wife used a cab yesterday. I don't see how it's It's not possibly... your business to see, Doctor. I'm asking your wife a question, a simple question. There's no reason to get panicky. I'm not panicky. I told you I'm... Just not used to anything like this. Peg came home in a cab yesterday about 2 o'clock. It was raining, so I took a cab. Of course. Was there a man in the cab with you? Yes. I don't know who he was. Well, what happened, Peg? Well, it was raining. And we were both waiting for a cab in front of the Exeter Hotel. I had lunch there, and one stopped. The man said it was his cab. I said it was mine. It was raining. So we both took it. And he dropped you off here. Well, I didn't tell you, Jean, because I didn't think it was important. But I didn't know who he was. I don't have any idea who he was, Mr. Guthrie. Oh, Ben. Uh, come in, ma'am. Any word? Yeah, I got a little news on that man in the hospital, the one Bailey beat up. Oh? The man will be all right, contusions. You know what I can't figure, Matt? Hmm? Bailey's wanted by the police, and he calls attention to himself in a barroom brawl. Well, Dr. Lynn had an answer for that. Bailey was so saturated with that poison, he didn't know what he was doing. Mm-hmm. Anything on Joe Raddick? No, nothing. You? Uh, I made a little call a while ago. Dr. and Mrs. Crossan. Woman looked a little worried. Oh? What about? Mm, I'd say about nothing. The fact that she's a woman, the fact that I'm a police. Uh-huh. She took a ride with George Miller, though, in a cab. Didn't know who he was. Just shared his cab in the rain. So, you figure what? Well, let's not make a big thing out of this, Matt. What I figure is what's obvious. You think his buddy Joe Raddick poisoned him? Don't you? <clears throat> Wait a minute. Van Guthrie speaking. What? Uh, talk a little louder, will you? Oh, uh-huh, I see. Well, thanks. Well, Matt? Well, what? You think Joe Raddick poisoned Miller? Sure I do. For what's left of the bank hall. Like I say, it's obvious. Find Raddick, we've got Miller's poisoner. We found Raddick. That phone call? Uh-huh. Great. So it's over. Right. It's over, Matt. For Raddick. He was just shot to death. happy to see what splendid names you have made for yourselves among the civilian population. Woodrow Wilson, at that time President of the United States, said this on December 25th, 1918, while addressing servicemen in France. Members of the armed forces have the same duty to represent the United States today, wherever they may be, as did those soldiers during World War I. As U.S. citizens in uniform, our military personnel have definite responsibilities to their God, to their country, and to themselves. All right, Nori, in here. I ain't no criminal. Bring him, Matt. Yeah. Come on, let's go, Nori. But I ain't no criminal. You guys know that, don't you? Sure, sure, sure. 
Just because there's a dead man here in my beat-up little room and house, you guys let your imagination run hot and cold. Just like I was a lawbreaker, or golly knows what. We just want to get you away from that room, Nori. We want to talk to you before those reporters do. Like I was a golly knows what. How long you been out of jail, Nori? So long ago, I can't remember which way the bars go, up and down or across and across. About six months? Seven. You hear me? I said seven. And since then, you've been running this rooming house? Sure. I studied room and house methods while I was in stir, observed keenly. Golly, What fellas. happened here? Who found Joe Raddick dead? The way you fellas talk to Nori's me. nervous, Ben. Oh? Yeah, shaking like a leaf. Look at my hands. Gee, look at his hands, Ben. They're really shaking, ain't they, Lieutenant? Gosh. You see? You see? Book him, Matt. Suspicion of murder. Fellas. Who, fo- who found Joe Raddick dead? I did. Who called the police? I did. Who killed him? Now, who there, fellas? Who now? Not me, not Maury, not old Nori. Uh-uh, fellas. No, no, but no. But you knew no. he was Joe Raddick. Everybody knows Joe. You know he was wanted? You know he was hiding out here in your hotel? Why didn't you call us then? Oh, that's a question. Did George Miller live here with him? Who? George Miller, George Bailey. You know who I mean. Same room with Joe. Used the room more than Joe. Joe didn't stay around Didn't much. Joe come here every night? Him? Joe? No. No, no, no. Not Joe. You know why? A dame used to call for him. They'd go out. That's why, fellas. What dame? Works the Diamond Dance Palace of Angels on Baker Street. Name of Stella Regan. I know... Well, Stella and me, we've danced. Question him and take him downtown, Matt. I'll call you later. Hey, Mac. The way I tower over you so close says you can't go in without you buy rolls of tickets. Rolls. Without rolls, nobody gets in. Oh, why don't you say so right off, Mac? For a policeman, it's free. I will even hold open the door and escort you in. There you are. Pick a flower, policeman. Stella Regan. Well, Rudy. That's nice picking. A little faded, maybe. A little wilted. But Stella makes the night smell good. She's that one. We sell refreshments, well, too. Rudy, you don't know what it means to me to have you call me like this. Miss Regan. I'm very sorry, Peter Pan, but you just lost your chance to Rudy Wettstein here. Uh, however, you may try again tomorrow. No, Stella. I'm from the police. Uh, beat it, Rudy. This gentleman has a priority. Beat it, Rudy, please. Now, come on, dance with me, Peter Pan. I'll arrange about the tickets later. Come on, 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 on. Arrange a place where we can talk, Stella, quietly. You work fast, Peter Pan. Dance first, then talk. That's what I said. We'll talk first, then dance. Come on. In here. It's good to talk. We girls rest here when we can't bear it no more. So far, it's not unbearable for any girl but me. You, uh, you caught Joe? No, we didn't catch him. That's good, that's good. You're gonna twist my arm to tell you where he is? It's been tried, never worked. We know where he is. He's dead. Shot to death. I got time to cry? Cry if you want, Stella. I cried. You brought me the death notice. You're happy. Goodbye, Peter Pan. He meant that much to you, Stella? You're quick. Yeah, yeah, Joe was that much to me. When did he hook on to George Bailey? Five, six years ago. Joe and me were at a place together, Fowler's Rest. Bailey came to the same place. Joe and George got on great. They knew each other's work, admired each other. That's when they decided to go to work together. Now, this place where you and Joe and George, where you all met, where was it? Fowler's Rest, on the south side of the lake. <laughs> Joe and me had it good up there. Joe rested there. Try it. I recommend it. You, uh, run out of questions? Goodbye, Peter Pan. Your name, Fowler? The man in the boathouse said your name was Fowler. 
I'm from the police. Here's the badge. My name's Fowler. Mine's Guthrie. Fowler. I'm trying to get some information about a man, about a couple of men. Who? A man named Joe Raddick. He fished here. And George Bailey. Friend of Raddick's. What can you tell me about them? I told you. Well, they used to come here often. Oh, now and then. Have you got anything against the police, Mr. Fowler? Both of my sons are police. I'm friendly to the police. Then what about Bailey and Raddick? Mm, nothing. They fished. Once they had a big time, a party. Yeah, what was the occasion? Bailey got married. Oh? Crossed the lake in Vineville about six years ago. Come back and had a party. Big party, very big. I'm friendly to the police, Mr. Guthrie. <laughs> Mr. Guthrie, the vital statistics you asked for be right here in this volume, 1934A to C. You're on the police line, huh? Yes, uh, look, Just no. call me Mr. Joyce, Fred Joyce. We'll get on better that way. Fellow across the lake has two boys in the police line. Know him well. Mr. Joyce, all yeah, right. I know, I know. Vital statistics, A to C, 1934. Uh, who is it you care about they're getting married between A and C in 1934? Uh, you want to know who somebody married, don't you? Who? I told you, George Bailey. Uh, yes, so you did. George Bailey, 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 Bailey. Mm. Fell in here yesterday asking for the same thing. There was? Mm-hmm. Babcock, Betty Bear. Yeah. Well, what do you know? What's the matter? That fellow that was here yesterday, the one I told you about? Yeah, remember? what about him? Well, the son of a gun tore the whole page out. Must have taken it with him, because it's tore out here, you see? Gee, I'm sorry, Mr. Guthrie. The Vineville Hall of Records just can't help you about who married George Bailey. Now, this man who was here yesterday, the man who tore out the page, who was he? Now, don't get riled, Mr. Guthrie, because it won't help, because I don't know. <coughs> uh, wait a minute. I just thought of something. Yes? Little girl next door in the grocery. She was riding her trike on the sidewalk and fell, and... This fella helped her, the fella who was here. I watched him help her. Maybe he and the little girl got acquainted. Can I help you, please? Some nice vegetables just came in. Uh, you have a little girl, a little girl who fell off her bike yesterday? I have. Why? Someone helped her when she fell. Do you know who he was? No. But my little girl might. We could ask her. But why should we ask her? Because I want to know. Because I'm a detective. Oh, sure you want to know. Carolyn! Come here. Hey, Carolyn. This man's a policeman. He wants to know who helped you when you fell off your bike yesterday. You don't know? <laughs> when she shakes her head like that, it means she don't know. She's shy with policemen. Uh -huh. Uh, look, uh, Carolyn, uh, that bandage on your leg, who put it there, honey? It's a very good bandage, the kind a doctor would use. Did the nice man who helped you yesterday put it there? And when she shakes her head like that, that means yes. Uh, she's awful shy with cops. <laughs> Ben, been waiting long? No, just got here. Well, from what you told me over the phone, I'd say you were playing a long shot. Unless you got something else to tell me. No, just what I told you. A bullet wound on George Bailey's body. A little girl with a bandaged leg. Well, the same doctor didn't have to do both of them. Look at it this way, Matt. Assume it was a doctor who bandaged that girl's leg. It could have been somebody else, but... All right. Well, assume it. Why should this doctor be interested in who married George Bailey? Interested enough to tear the page out of a record book? Well, maybe he's the kind of man who likes to tear pages out of books. Come on. Where are we going? That house where that new Nash is parked. The one with the doctor's emblem on it. Dr. Crossan's house. Did you check the bank? Uh-huh. Good. Hello, Dr. Crossan. Mr. Guthrie. Yeah, this is Sergeant Greb, Doctor. May we come in? Please do. 
Now what, Mr. Guthrie? Is your wife here? Yes. Uh, please get her, Doctor. Do you want to annoy her again? Get her, Doctor. The lieutenant and I want to talk to her. To you, too. All right. Peg. Peg, come in here. The police are here again, Peg. Oh. Yes, Mr. Guthrie, what is it this time? This time it's a little more serious, Mrs. Crossan. Jean, have they told you what they want? No, they haven't. You've uh, got a pretty good practice here, haven't you, Doctor? I get along. Nice waiting rooms here, nice furnishings. You must get along pretty good. Wouldn't you say so, man? Yeah, I'd say so. You a gambling man, Doctor? No. What right do you have to ask a question like that? That's right, Matt. Why do you ask a question like that? Well, the doctor's been making some pretty heavy withdrawals the last couple of months. I checked his bank. That's the only reason I asked. Oh. You a gambling man, Doctor? I have expenses. That's why I make withdrawals. Cut it out, Doctor. You've been paying blackmail. Jean paying blackmail? Haven't you, Doctor? Haven't you, Doctor? Hmm? Or, do you, or are you going to accuse us of surmising? Hmm? What do you say, Doctor? Just because I got in the cab with a man, you hound us. Blackmail to George Bailey and George Raddick, huh? <sighs> Mrs. No Crossan. What? You were married to George Bailey once, weren't you? You can't prove that. Jean. You've no proof of it. Because you tore it out of the Vineville records. Well, it doesn't matter. You can't prove it. If we took you back to Vineville and let a little girl look at you, I think we can. A doctor tore the page out of the Vineville records. You. Because your wife's name was on that page married to George Bailey. All right. Are you arresting me for tearing a page out of the book? Oh, for more than that, Doctor. You're going to lose your license. We're arresting you for malpractice. Oh, please. Please, it wasn't his fault. Not Jean. You brought Bailey here, didn't you, Mrs. Cross? He forced me to bring him to Jean when he was wounded in that bank robbery. Forced you? How? I was still married to Bailey. Don't you see? I hadn't heard from him for four years. I thought he was dead. I thought he was dead. Go on, Mrs. Crossan. <laughs> then he came to me wounded, and he said if I didn't get Jean to help him, he'd expose me, he'd ruin my husband. You really loused it for me, didn't you, Peg? What? What did you say? You bring him to me, I help him, then they both blackmail me, bleed me. You were a hoodlum's wife, Peg. If you'd told me, I wouldn't have married you, and this wouldn't have happened. Jean. After what I did for you. Poison Bailey. When you had lunch with I him at the Exeter Hotel. I did it for you. And shot Raddick. Jean, it was for you to rid of them, those two. For Jean, I did Murderous. it. Murderous. I killed for you, Jean. I killed him for you. For malpractice, gentlemen, you'll arrest me for that. You'll note I had no part of the murders. Jean. Jean. All right, Doctor. Jean. Uh, Mr. Cross. <laughs> Matt. Hmm? <laughs> Don't bother with the cuffs. Lineup has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. (laughs) 